need your power and fill this place. Fill this room, come take your, your right for the 
voice. Just lift up your worship right where you are. We honor you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have won every victory. You have won every battle, Father. You have defeated our enemies. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus.
You've won the victory. You've won it all for me. You won the victory. You've won it all for me. Can we see? You won the. You won it all for me. You won the victory. You've won it all for me. You've won the victory. You've won it all for me. You've won the victory. You've won it all for me. And he always wins. He always wins. Say 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 he always wins. He's never lost a battle. 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 He won't start now. And he won't start now. And he won't start now. He always wins. Hallelujah. You have won. That worship is just ringing true. I just needed it to continue to minister to me while I'll read you our text for today. Luke, the second chapter, 10th verse. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Good news. Good news. Good news. I bring you good news. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. My text comes here. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, excuse me, cloths, and lying in a manger. Here's the good news for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. My theme for you today is make room. Say that within your spirit. Say that all over the building. Make room. The word of the Lord comes to us today in a time where sometimes we don't know what to do. You'll notice these, now the third, but these last three messages have been really focused on our contemporary time. God has spoken with continuity, giving us direction in a time where, whether we know it or not, we need direction from him. And there is a time in our life where we are to take inventory of where we are, who's there with us, what we have and what we need. And in preparing to minister to you all, the Lord told me 
to make room. Pillar of Fire Church being a new church here in St. Louis, Missouri, doesn't come because there was capacity <laughs> that I saw in my life, capacity that Pastor Karen saw in her life. We had to make room to do what God was calling us to do. We had to make all sorts of room, not just in our schedules, physically in our house for all kinds of equipment. We had to make room to plan, make room to bring along partners who have joined with us to get us off the ground, make room for things not to go right, make room for things to go better than we ever imagined. And God is saying the same thing to each of us. He wants us to make room. So when we look at the specific text, Luke, the second chapter, we're talking about the arrival of Jesus Christ. And out of all of the ways to arrange the, reside, the, the, the uh, arrival of God's son, who would take residence and reside on this earth with us in flesh, I found this really to be strange and awkward. Not because I didn't see planning for the Lord and Savior coming. It's not because we didn't know in advance that Jesus would come and be born and walk among us. But something about the circumstances just was unsettling. In this particular text, we learn with clarity that Jesus was born in a manger in a barn, not a hotel, not a resort, not a hospital, not a private practice, but in a barn with animals. I don't want to know how that even smelled. And a baby in that environment that was not sterilized, not meant or intended for that particular uh, um, uh, call, it wasn't designed to be a nursery. It wasn't designed to be an ICU or a hospital. But that was God's plan. I struggle with this because I look at everything that was done in advance. There's a prophecy, Isaiah 53, hundreds of years before the text and the occurrence that shows up in the text in Luke 2. There's a prophecy that he was coming. Micah 5 and 2 even prophesied that he would come from Bethlehem. So not only that he was coming, but even where he was coming from was foretold by hundreds and hundreds of years. So how did we forget to secure a hospital? How did we forget to secure a physician? And we had all this time to plan for the moment that God designed for us. It's interesting, when things don't go right in life, I'm, I'm with everybody, I get it. You know, I'm frustrated, I go through the emotions and all that, and honestly, I'm a person that believes sometimes you deserve the opportunity to recognize the experience you're having. Nothing's wrong with that to say, this is terrible. I wish it were better. These people backed out on me. I needed this person to do this. Somebody who's supposed to be close to me in my life should be doing this. I don't understand why people can't get together and coordinate. I don't understand how you could work here and not know that these are essential functions of your job that you articulated to me. So when I come to you expecting you to perform the service that you're built to do as a business, why can't you perform that? We deserve the opportunity to recognize that. But sometimes the hardest thing to see is when we've been in the planning position and we were poor planners. When things don't go well, it's not always the stuff out of our control because we say that sometimes that's the throw off. You know, well, everything's not in my control. Well, you know, there's unforeseen situations and circumstances. Yes, but do we take time and inventory of what we are responsible to do in terms of our planning? I want you to know that as powerful and as divine as God is and how he can perform miracles, He's not looking to perform a miracle for us every day. And we shouldn't be seeking a miracle every day. Everything shouldn't be a miracle. You know, I woke up, you know, brushed my teeth, my breath was fresh. Man, miracle. No, that's your job. That's, that's kind of the part that you're supposed to do. There's a whole lot of 
pieces that we need to plan for and take inventory for. That's our job. And we shouldn't be depending on God to perform miracles to get us out of situations that he's empowered us to resolve. He's giving us power over the enemy. He made and formed us in his image and likeness, which means we have the capacity to make some decisions within our pay grade that he's not going to make for us. There's things that we're praying to God to work out where he's saying it's in your job description to work it out. There's things that we're praying on God to resolve that he's saying, I put the tools, the experience, the knowledge, the persons, and the resources in your hands because I expected you to work it out when it came. So Jesus being born in a manger seems like poor planning to me. We had hundreds of years to get ready for it. Interesting. I also found the circumstances connected to Mary. Think about this. Mary is pregnant. God sends an angel to Joseph. He doesn't leave her, but she's pregnant. They travel for far and long. The angels announce Jesus' birth to the shepherds in the field. And in the time of the pregnancy, months, let's, let's make the assumption that she went at least seven, eight months. We got eight months to find a room. The travel, we had all this time to make a room. We even had the point where the shepherds were brought into the picture. We had all sorts of time to make room for him and all the sudden, we just completely botch it. We fail. And our Savior is stuck in a manger. How does that happen with all of the people involved, all of the Pharisees, all of the priests, all of the scribes who knew the scriptures, who knew Micah, who knew Isaiah, and we can't coordinate to get our Savior adequate space? Hmm. I struggle because we have a manger We have a stable for a pregnant, wait, pregnant fiance. Ah, outside of even the room, God in flesh is born in a dysfunctional family environment. Joseph is like, uh, that day and time didn't come. We in, in, the Lord, what do you say, Mary? The Lord said what? <laughs> hmm. Let me go to my Bible and scripture because, you know, sometimes we weaponize the Bible. I ain't seen none of that, Mary. I ain't seen no divine conception, none of that in the Bible and the word. And you mean to tell me that the Lord told you that you pregnant by him, overshadowed in the Holy Spirit? Mm. Dysfunctional family situation. So let's even get away from the manger and the stable and the barn. God in the flesh is born in a broken home. There's a trust problem in the relationship between Mary and Joseph instantly. And I know it. I'm not inferring it because the Bible says an angel had to consult with Joseph to give him the confidence not to put Mary away. But we think single parent families and and, and households and, and households where folks don't know both of their natural biological parents. We think adoption. We think dysfunctional and, and, and abusive homes. We think that's a contemporary problem. But Jesus himself was born to a dysfunctional family. He wasn't born to the model family where the mother and father were married and, and they had the, the baby nursery prepared and they had his clothes laid out and they had yellow in case they didn't want to know the gender and they had pink in case he was a girl and, and they had blue in case he was a boy. He wasn't born after After baby showers that had been thrown and gift registries were put together and Target and Macy's and Kohl's and Nordstrom. And he wasn't born with all of this organization and bridal shower games. And he wasn't born in a circumstance where God parents were picked out. And those were the type of people that would be great mentors and would take care of him if anything happened to the parents. Jesus wasn't born in the ideal situation where there could be a private physician brought into the home to deliver Mary in her own comfort and own circumstances and own environment and that surgeon went to an Ivy League school where he was trained in an intricate and in a high level way that he could perform the duty with the least amount of error. He wasn't born in perfect circumstances. He was born in dysfunction. And we experience dysfunction and we get mad at the Lord. But if there's anybody who understands dysfunction, it is the Lord. If anybody understands imperfection, it is the Lord. 
If anybody understands what it means to start with lack, it is the Lord. His parents aren't even married. And then they're on the journey. They're dealing with a candidate who's in office that they didn't vote in that said you need to oblige by a census. So you need to go back to your environment. And I don't care socially or not if you're pregnant, if you don't have money to travel, if you don't have the means to have comfortable transportation, you go back to where you're from and be counted for the census. They're born in a circumstance of disarray. I may not have chosen to have a child in the pandemic where the world is is blocked off and I have to make appointments so far in advance with uh, my OBGYN and I have to schedule virtual appointments ahead of time and sometimes they cancel the appointment because they themselves may have gotten COVID and they have to attend to their families and they can't do their regular duties. We think these circumstances are contemporary, but the Lord himself was birthed in a dysfunctional environment in a dysfunctional society, in a dysfunctional political climate, to dysfunctional parents. Let me tell you something. When you have a divine purpose in a life, don't be surprised when you find yourself boxed in. I know we want that big, elaborate nursery. I know we want that room with a certain square footage. I know we want to do the padding and the trimmings and the the cushions and the buffers. And I know we want the mobile floating around the baby playing the right lullaby that will put them to sleep. But don't be surprised when your most prized possessions and the things that are most precious to you in life are thrown and boxed in. Because the Lord started there. He started in a box that livestock ate terrible food out of we ain't talking about those those pets you know where you cut up the filet mignon and and you call fido to the table and you got that medium rare steak and you just throw a little paprika on top and you give it to them we ain't talking about them type of pets we talking about livestock outside all year long it reminds me when i was growing up my mama used to say boy you smell like outside and i'm like what does outside smell like because when i'm out there it all smells the same what's that (laughs) he was born in a manger Smelling like the food that the livestock ate. Conditions. Conditions sometimes seem far less than ideal. It's interesting that an all-powerful God didn't postpone the birth of Jesus waiting upon the right conditions to meet him. It's interesting that an all-knowing, all-powerful God didn't say, wait a minute, shepherds, you ain't got yourselves together. And you know what? The, the, the barnkeeper ain't got herself together. I understand if we got to do that, that's the best we can do. But y'all ain't even coordinated. And Mary and Joseph, y'all ain't on the same page. And where's your family and your circumstance? And wait a minute, uh, the baby shower was scheduled and then you had to cancel. Oh, no, wait a minute. Hold on. Do, do you have the baby's 501 uh, plan put together because this baby going to go to college one day? Uh, The Lord wasn't born into perfect conditions, and the Lord didn't postpone the birth of Jesus Christ to get the uh, conditions perfect. Something about God was settled and comfortable and even pleased with imperfect conditions. When we see imperfect conditions in our life, it doesn't mean there's an absence of a God who provides provision. It means that there's a God who has confidence that you make the situation better than it was had it been made and provided for you. Let me tell you something. God, who is all powerful, all creative, who can create the world from a thought, who can speak and cosmic cosmic uh, collisions happen and create atmospheres and environments and conditions and settings and seasons, all just by a thought and a word. He has made you in his image. So if he's made you in his image and all that power lies within you, then what do you expect your conditions to be? Because really the effort of God was about getting you your power, not to set your environment and your conditions to be a perfect setting for you. Why am I going to invest in creating an environment for a person who is born from a creator? Why am I going to spend time getting people in alignment when I put you in position to work through your own conflicts? Why am I going to invest in in answering your prayers to situations that you can solve when you really put your mind to it? Why am I going to invest my time in sending you the resources when you're praying for when I've given you the opportunity to have that earning potential? God put his emphasis and his power and his energy on empowering us, all of us with everything we need to make perfect conditions 
But we look at God and we feel shortchanged because we're presented with an imperfect condition. But let me tell you something. The pride of every father and every mother is to see the child put the lessons to application. The pride of every father and every mother is to see the moments where the child can stand on their own. The moments where the child can take the knowledge that was only meant and intended to be fundamental and they start to put it together. Because let me tell you something. I don't go out throughout my day reciting the alphabet. I put words together. I put sentences together. I put paragraphs together. I put novels together. I put proposals together. I put policies together. I put legislation together. God gave me an alphabet. I'm not mad that he didn't set me up with a life insurance policy. God gave me an alphabet. I'm not upset because I didn't have my will and the will wasn't put together all correctly for me. God gave me the opportunity to create everything that was deficient in my coming. But I still have a little bit of a problem. I know I'm going back and forth on this because I can hear myself even say that and I still look at these imperfect conditions. One of the things that I guess is really bothering me as I was exploring and walking through this text is in a time that Mary and Joseph needed help and support most, God drove them into isolation. This young woman, this teenage girl, according to the typical tradition of the time and our best knowledge and thinking, this teenage girl is pregnant. The man who is with her hasn't even married her. She's taking this journey in the back of her mind knowing that at any point in time, he can go his own way. Legally and morally, he can go his own way. And instead of putting her in the sister circle, instead of surrounding her with all those aged and those seasoned women that can give her the advice and give her the confidence and the certainty and they even help her on the side develop a plan B, he drives her into isolation. He drives her to depend on the person that she's not sure she can depend on. And this is the mother of our savior. There's a lot of research out there that talks about the ways that a stress on a pregnant woman impact the baby. Not just the delivery, but I'm talking about the genetic trauma that that baby is predispo dis predisposed to just because of the stress of the mother. Jesus in his DNA was predisposed to trauma. He was predisposed to alcohol addiction. He was predisposed to illegal drug addiction. Jesus in his DNA was pre-exposed to hypertension. He was pre-exposed to diabetes just because of the stress that was on his mother while she carried him. We carry predispositions that the enemy wants to exploit. He wants us to go unaware that the trauma of the prior generation has an impact on us. I know we say and we look ourselves in the eyes and we say, I'm going to be different. My dad wasn't there. When I have a child, I'm going to be there for him. My mama wasn't a good mama, and she was running around and doing all those things when it's my turn. We have that in our minds, but we don't realize that running in our DNA is an acquaintance with stress and trauma. And then we run up on a situation when they ain't got my nursery right. And what comes out of us? My precious baby is here. And you're going to put him in a filthy circumstance. And the people I need most are the people who are nowhere to be found. But as I dove deeper into this text, I began to understand the true path that Christ took to get us. Because how many people know, aside from the condition, God is a God who cares about first impression. The first impression that we have of God is what? Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form. It was without structure. It was without a template to be able to fall onto. It was without anything that we could look to figure out and say, am I on the right path? It was without form. 
but he created it and it was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was a dark society in a dark world where a creator, if anything, they need light, but he worked in the darkness to create something that was good. Our first impression of God isn't just that of a creator, but of a God who is excelling and creating in the dark. The Lord is working behind the scenes in your life and he is creating something in the dark that you can't even see. And I know it's not even formed and it's void and your circumstance, even if people listen to you complain, they, your circumstance is so unique and unusual, you have nothing to even reference to figure out which way is up. But I want you to know that the first creation, uh, the first impression of the God that we serve is a creative person who doesn't need light to do it. Because everything that the Lord needs, he feels his way through. He can feel it because it was a part of him. He can feel it because it was in his thoughts. He can feel it because he practiced that run so much. I don't need to look at the fretboard so much. He can feel it because I know exactly where where every drum and every cymbal is in position and when I need to do what I need to do I don't need to look around to see what's going on and I don't even need to look around to have confirmation that what is in place is in place. I feel it because I did it. I built it. I structured it. I set it up. I practiced it. God has a muscle memory that he didn't leave back in Genesis 1 on 1 and that muscle memory is when things are dark in your life. That's when I can show you how great I am. When things are dark in your life I can create something that's new and different because in your DNA, I need to do something new and different. Your DNA carries old and terrible. It carries trauma. It carries violence. It carries stress. It carries dysfunction. So I'm going to do something new and different. And guess what? Nobody's going to be able to speak to you because I'm doing it in the dark. I'm forming the world in the dark because I don't want the enemy to know what those plans are. I don't want him to know the plan of attack so he can get ahead of it. I'm going to do this thing in the dark, which means you're going to have to trust me a little bit. Because not only is it dark because the enemy can't see it but it's dark because I need you to be able to depend on me because if I let you even see a little thing you're going to jump ahead of me if I even let you see where I'm going you're going to give me suggestions that I don't need because I am the all powerful God I'm the creator I'm the alpha and the omega and I work in the dark first impressions are everything and I start to feel better because if the first impression is a God who can create the world in the dark, then when Jesus is born in a manger, it must not be a big issue. I want you to release your hearts in this moment to know that what wasn't in your life didn't need to be there. Who wasn't good for you didn't need to be good for you. The situations that your family didn't set you up for, God got something for you that they can't set you up for. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to understand that it wasn't important for all the circumstances of Jesus' birth to be perfect because he was doing something that had never been done before. And God can never do anything that's never done before by referencing what already exists referencing the things that we can see and perceive that we call perfect, referencing the things that are constructed and orchestrated that we become familiar with. He can't do something new in your life and reference anything that's ever been done. The first impression of Jesus is he's boxed in. He's in a dysfunctional situation, and yet it is divine. The interesting thing about all of this Jesus wasn't put in a room that was made for him because he was the son of a carpenter. When you have a certain skill set, when you have a certain knowledge and foundation, you don't come into a situation complaining about the limitations. You look for fixes. Come on, somebody. You look and say, because my daddy is a carpenter, I can tell I need to address that right away. And because my daddy is a carpenter, I can see that this floor is a little bit unbalanced. Because my daddy is a carpenter, I can tell you that this is going to erode over time, so I'm going to have to put some energy on that. I can tell you that because my daddy is a carpenter, I don't have to remove these beams over here because all we need to do is create some decoration and some ornamentation, and that can actually be a part that makes this room distinctive as opposed to being an eyesore. Because my daddy is a carpenter, I am absolutely 
empowered to make the room. The word today is make room because God has put you in situations and in rooms that aren't perfect because he put you to make the room. He didn't put you in the room because the room was going to make you. He didn't put you in the circumstance because the circumstance is going to make you. He didn't put you in that church because the church was going to make you. He wanted you to be a part of a solution. We keep going to places with the disposition of looking for answers. We're looking for problems to be solved. We're looking for things to be perfect to make us comfortable. But God has called you to make the room when you come in it. Let me tell you something. Maybe I'm just a little arrogant, but I feel like any room I walk into automatically becomes better because I'm there. If any party I walk into and it's boring, that party is fun because I'm there. If there's a church service that's dead, listen, my worship is going to impact you and rub off on you. So either you're going to get with me or you're going to get off of my road. God has put me in the room because he wants me to make the room. Let me tell you something. If it was up to me, I would have had both of my sons born in a manger because if that's what it takes for divine purpose, if that's what it takes for dominion, if that's what it takes for anointing, if that's what it takes for glory, put me in a box. You can call me whatever you want to. You can call this environment whatever you want to. Put me in the filth. Roll me in the food. Roll me in the mud. Roll me in the order and the, and the odor and the stench because if that's what it takes for me to have success, if that's what it takes for me to walk into my destiny, put me in the box. Come on, somebody say put me in the box. Put me in the box. I don't want the nursery. I want the box. I want the ability for God to show up and show out in my life to come forth. I want the ability for God to show exactly what he taught me and trained me to do to come forth. Because let me tell you something. Every generation gets better. God put it in me because there was something I was to accomplish that the generation before couldn't. I didn't have them as a backbone. But I'm going to support not just my family. I'm going to support my block and my community. I'm going to create nonprofit organizations that serve the same hurts that I used to suffer from. I'm going to create policies that hold the government accountable to serve people who were dysfunction and, and, and inconvenienced by policies that didn't respect them. God gave me the opportunity to be the improvement of the problem that the prior generation faced. God gave me the opportunity to give the advice on how to train employees and how to train the front desk and how to train people who are working with folks who have been battered and how to train to work with immigrants children. God has given me the opportunity because it's in my DNA to be acquainted with your issue. A book can't teach me because it's in my DNA. Your training can't teach me because it's in my DNA. And because something is in my DNA that's not in your DNA, I become invaluable. I will always have rooms accessible to me because you can't emulate what God has put in my spirit. You can't emulate the history that God has allowed me to heal from. You can't emulate the crushing that's uh, taken place on my life for the oil to flow out. So put me in the box. Somebody give praise to God. God is drawn to brokenness and need. He's drawn to the imperfect. But his consistency, you can go back to his first impression. What can't the Lord create? What ways can't he make? What circumstance can he not overcome? What situations are so dark that he can't do what he needs to do? What situations are so unique that he can't create and advance and rejuvenate and revive and restore? What situation can he not address? The box isn't the problem. The box isn't the problem. They told you you're only good at this. They told you you'd only amount to this. They hired you and they said, well, you've been working there for so long, but just stay in that department because you're good there and we need you there. The box isn't the problem. The problem is you haven't yet recognized that you can make the room and the box is in the room. Let's get away from metaphors. God hasn't just empowered you to change your situation, he's empowered you to change environments. Shepherds were drawn to a barn, not a monument. Shepherds, especially for those in ministry, were drawn to a barn. Kings and wise men were drawn to a barn, not a temple, not a tabernacle. They were drawn to the room that Christ made. What made the room is that he was in the room. 
because he is the solution. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is everything we need. He's in the room. And if it takes for me to operate in a box, put me in the box. Because I'm trying to make the room. I'm trying to change the block. I'm trying to change the neighborhood. I'm trying to change the city. I'm trying to change the county. I'm trying to change the state. I'm trying to change the region. I'm trying to change the country. I'm trying to change uh, our continent. I'm trying to change the world. I think I went in order. I'm trying to make a change with my life. But if you're focused on the box, the only thing you'll get is a better box. But if you're focused on what God put in you, to change everything around you. God is calling you forth. He's calling your dysfunction and your hurt. He's calling the shortcomings because you're in the room to make the room. In this moment, our hearts become an altar. Let's just take a second to let the word just sink into our spirit. And the Lord is going to speak. Dear God, I'm in a box. I'm in a limited situation. I'm not just in a box, but I'm the product of dysfunction. I'm the product of imperfection. For me, Maybe not others, but for me, things didn't go as planned, or so I thought. I don't know why I'm here, but the walls are closing in around me. I don't know why I'm here, but I'm starting to give up hope on my ability to do anything but be in this box. In this moment, everything that's been a part of the pathology that has led to me being me, my parents, my family, my grandparents, my socioeconomic status, my race, my color, my gender, the way my face looks, the way my body is shaped, all of that has contributed to this mess that I see in this box. It's like people don't want to be around me, I think. It's like the, the people I should be able to count on, the circle, the support is unreachable. Either they can't reach me or I can't reach them. And out of all the things I don't know, I know now that I don't need to know. You showed me that you work in the dark and you form and shape worlds. Take a hold of my life. Put your hands on me. In this moment of darkness, of uncertainty, shape me, form me, teach me, empower me to be the solution and the answer to not only break out of my box, but to change this room, to change this environment and this world. Lord, I ask that you give me the character and integrity to be a positive influence that those who are drawn to my situation need. All of the eyes that are on me, all the conversations my name is in, you've provided a pulpit for your gospel. I just wanna play my part. Whatever you would have me to do, empower me to do. Teach me, show me, lead me, speak to me, arrest me, empower me, uplift me, restore me, resurrect me. For your glory, in your name I pray.